Hey there, and welcome back to another video on Englishes around the world. Today we'll be taking a closer look at English as it is spoken in North America. The plan for this video is that we will first cover the historical basis of how American English came about. In earlier videos in this series, I talked about colonialism and about the worldwide expansion of English. American English, of course, fits into that broader picture and we'll see where it has its place in the ecology of world Englishes that we've been talking about up to this point. After that, we'll concentrate on the sounds of American English and that will really be the main point of this video. I'll be asking what the main phonological patterns are that allow us to distinguish North American varieties of English from each other. In the last video, I did something similar. I contrasted two varieties of British English and one thing that distinguishes British and American English is that the density of different varieties, the density of different dialects, is much higher in Britain than it is in North America. That of course has to do with history and specifically it has to do with patterns of migration which in the case of America have led to massive dialect mixture. Yeah? Nonetheless, there are different North American varieties of English that we can distinguish and I would like to present the kinds of sounds that let us differentiate between them so that you can tell, for example, whether a speaker is from the southern United States or from California or from Canada. At the end of this video, we'll test how well that works. I have brought recordings from three mystery speakers and I'll ask you to listen to those recordings to identify relevant sounds and to match those sounds with characteristics of the main varieties of North American English. So you'll have an opportunity to test how well you can actually tell those varieties apart. Okay, if you're ready, then we can actually get started. Uh, how did American English come about? Earlier in this video series, I talked about the different diasporas of English. American English is part of the so-called second diaspora that has also given rise to Australian English. What these two have in common is that they represent a certain variety of British colonialism, namely America and Australia are both settlement colonies that involve the large-scale relocation of people who are of English ancestry and who are settling permanently in overseas areas. What this means is that these people have English as their language already and they are mostly in contact with other speakers of English so they're not in a situation of bilingualism or multilingualism. What's crucial, however, is that the social networks of these speakers are changing. They arrive in new settings and they are in contact with speakers who might use a different dialect or a different variety of English. And when this happens, the linguistic consequence is what's called coenization. It's also called dialect mixing or dialect leveling. And in concrete terms, speakers adopt a sort of linguistic compromise. Settlers with different dialects develop a common variety. And typically this means that features that are shared across the different dialects are maintained. They are kept yeah, because they're useful in communication and features that are dialect specific, yeah, that might not be so well known outside a given dialect, they have a greater chance of being lost or being replaced by something that is used more widely. Okay, so settlement colonies involve different dialects coming together and this is why American English and Australian English are actually classified in the E-Wave as high contact L1 varieties. So this doesn't mean that there is contact between different languages, but rather in this case, there is contact between different dialects, between different varieties of the same language. Now, historically, American English started with the colonization of Newfoundland in the late 16th century. And we actually know a few things about the early settlers and where they came from, namely from Southwest England and Southeast Ireland. Uh, Newfoundland was of course just one out of a larger number of so-called original colonies along the Atlantic coast of North America. Quite a bit is known about the origins and the social characteristics of the early settlers so that we know for example that Puritans from Southeast England settled in New England, the 
area of the United States that's known as New England. Um, members of the royalist upper class, the Cavalier gentry, uh, settled in Virginia. Working people from Scotland and Ireland settled in the Appalachian Mountains. And then uh, Midland and Northern Quakers set out to join the great westward track and so on and so forth. The basic idea that I'd like you to take away from this slide is that these settlements were the cause for the divisions that we see today in the characteristics of North American English. Settlement colonies typically show so-called founder effects. So the linguistic characteristics of the early settlers have a disproportionately large effect on how the language develops subsequently. Right. So just to mention a few dates for those of you who enjoy history, we have the settlement of Newfoundland at the end of the 16th century. And then soon after we have settlements in Virginia and all along the Atlantic coast. And uh, these colonies declare their independence in 1776. That might be a date that you knew already. And they extend their territories westward in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. Now, if you're thinking Louisiana, I know that that's in the south, that's not the west of the Atlantic coast, you're actually quite right. The territory of the Louisiana Purchase was in fact a lot larger than the state that today is called Louisiana. Throughout the 19th century, the settlers continuously further expanded their territories towards the west until they eventually reached the Pacific coast. The California gold rush in 1848 is one date that is useful to keep in mind in that context. Right, so that's all the history I have. Uh, let's move on to the sounds of American English. What are the main phonological patterns that distinguish North American varieties of English? To explore that, we're going to use another fantastic resource, namely the Atlas of North American English, which exists both as a book and as a multimedia resource. So you can see if you find it online and if you have access to it. Uh, the book costs a little more than your average paperback. It's around 700, 800 US dollars. But if you have access to a good university library and they have it, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, don't lose it or the librarian will get very angry. Uh, the mastermind behind this atlas is a linguist you should know, namely Bill Above. If you're a regular on this channel, you've definitely heard this name a couple of times. It's the Bill Above of the New York City fourth floor study of Martha's Vineyard, etc., etc. So Bill Above is one of the greatest linguists currently alive. Right. So what is in that atlas? The Atlas has linguistic maps that show varieties of North American English. And here on this map, for example, you see dots that represent speakers that have been sampled. And the dots are grouped together into varieties. So the red dots that you see in the southern part of the United States, they form a dialect region, the south. Here I've zoomed into that area a little further and you see that the atlas gives you nice little summaries of the most important sound features that characterize not only southern United States English, but also all the other varieties. So there's a lot of useful information in this atlas. Um, the atlas allows you to work with this information in two ways. Either you can focus on a variety and check what feature characterize that variety or you can zoom in on a sound feature and you can check how that feature is distributed across different varieties. In the following, I will take that approach. Yeah? So we'll start with features and we'll try to understand what they are and then we'll go back to the varieties and see which varieties carry that feature. Yeah? If you're ready, um, here we go. There are six features that I want to focus on. Um, that is not an exclusive list, but these features are those features that you're likely to come across when you read literature about uh, the North American landscape of English. So these are really useful to know. Um, the features are the pin-pen merger, the cot-cot merger, the northern cities shift, 
I monophthongization, U fronting, and Canadian raising. Let's start with the pin pen merger. Now, as you might imagine, uh, speakers with the pin pen merger pronounce the words pin and pen in the same way. However, uh, the merger is not a compromise between I and E, rather, it is a raising of the E up to the I. So here's a vowel chart, and if you've watched earlier videos in this series, you are very familiar with these vowel charts. If you're not familiar with them, please watch the video on language variation or the one on British English, and you will see what all of this means here. Um, so back to the pin pen merger, um, E is raised to I, so that the word pen sounds in fact like pin. Yeah? So that's also true for other words. So the word when is pronounced as win. Uh, I want to play you a short recording of a speaker with the pin pen merger. Um, here we go. Chicken Joe is my cat, one of my cats. He got his name because he likes to sleep in the hen house. When it got cold, we'd go out looking for him. We couldn't find him. We'd go and open up the hen house and there he would be out there in the hen house because hens are very warm if you didn't know that. Okay, so this speaker talks about the hen house. Yeah, well, a female chicken is called a hen or if you are this speaker, they're hens. Yeah, right. So that's the pin pen merger. Uh, where do we find that merger? We find it mostly in the south of the USA. So every red dot that you see on this map is a speaker who has the merger, both in production, in the way they pronounce their words, and also in perception, the way they hear words. So um, the green dots are speakers who maintain a distinction between pen and pin. Now, I cannot really present this map without making a little comment about Florida. You see the tip, uh, the southern tip of Florida does not have the uh, pin pen merger. And um, well, I'd like to ask you, do you know why that might be? Why is there this strange little group of uh, Florida residents who resist the pin pen merger? The answer is simply that, well, uh, those are uh, people who have retired, yeah? uh, people who actually lived in the north throughout their lives. And once they retired, they relocated to sunny Florida. And uh, this is where they maintain the difference between pin and pen and are unfazed by all the pin pen merging that goes on around them. Right. So that's that. Uh, let's move on to the caught caught merger. Uh, this is a merger between a low back vowel and a center vowel. Uh, the low back vowel is the kind of sound that you would hear in the words caught, law, dawn or bought. And then there is a low center vowel that you have in hot, not or what. Um, okay, so this is a scenario where these two are not merged. So in the inland north of the US, uh, the caught caught merger is not there. And in the west, we have a lower ring of uh, the low back vowel. Yeah. <clears throat> and so the two are pronounced as the same. I want to play you a recording of uh, Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters fame saying, I thought. Okay, let's listen to this. I thought that I would. Gonna play it again. I thought that I would. Now, I don't know about you, but what I hear is, I thought. Yeah, so I thought with um, <clears throat> not an aw type sound, but more of an ah type sound. Uh, that is the caught caught merger. And uh, in terms of the vowel chart, what it means is that caught moves down and a bit towards the center. Now, where in North America do we find the caught caught merger? Uh, the better question would be to ask, where do we not find it? Yeah. Everything that's cycled in uh, green here 
is actually an area with the merger and um, so that means it's not in the area here uh, which is the inland north and then there are places along the Atlantic coast and the south yeah so there we don't have the merger but in all the rest people thought and bought and they break the law and do things like that yeah I'm not judging moving on the next thing I want to discuss is actually a little complicated. It's the northern cities shift. The only good thing about the northern cities shift is that you know exactly where it is happening, namely in the inland north in the northern cities. Uh, so these cities that participate in the northern cities shift are Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, everything south of the Great Lakes. This is where you will find the northern cities shift. Now, more importantly, what is the Northern Cities shift? It's a chain shift, kind of like the Great Vowel shift. If you are a regular viewer on this channel, you will have come across a video where I discuss the Great Vowel shift. But whereas that shift happened a long time ago in England and affected long vowels, the uh, Northern Cities shift is happening right now and it affects short vowels in the way that you see here. So we're looking at a chain of six interrelated shifts and we're going to examine each one of these with an example. So um, let's start with the trap vowel, which does something very peculiar. It is raised and paired with a schwa so that the word man comes out as mien. Okay, so instead of a, ear. Don't ask me, yeah? Um, that's the first one. The second shift concerns words such as God, and they are fronted, so they sound like gad, yeah? From God to gad. That is the second shift that you see down here, yeah? The first, the trap vowel goes up, and this vowel is fronted to a. Ah. Um, we're moving on to the third one, which concerns words such as thought. And that's actually something that looks a lot like the caught caught merger, where we also have lower ring of caught, uh, except here, speakers that have the uh, Northern Cities shift, they don't merge the two because caught is fronted. Yeah, so caught is fronted, caught is lowered, so the two sounds are not the same in the inland north, whereas in other regions they are. If you find this confusing, don't worry, other people also find it confusing. Let's not worry about it, let's move on to the next sound shift, which concerns the uh, word dress and similar words. So the vowel in dress is centered, that is uh, this shift here, so it sounds more like dress, yeah? You may ha have heard this in the word yes, for example, when people say yes. Or you may have seen that written out as Y-A-S-S, yeah? Uh, for example, on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you spend too much time online, yeah? That is an effect of the Northern Cities shift. Okay. Um, then we have this word here, uh, the vowel that you have, for example, in the word but, a center vowel. Uh, that one moves further to the back, so it becomes bot instead of but. Yeah? Okay, so but is realized as bot, and that leaves only the uh, last element here, words such as kid. Uh, that have an i type vowel. There the i is lowered to a, so the word kid sounds like cad. Yeah? Now, what creeps me out about the Northern City shift is that speakers who have it are completely oblivious of the fact that they do, and they will actually deny that any of this is real. Yeah? So it might just be a conspiracy, except we have recordings of these speakers where they behave in exactly this way. Anyway, it's a set of features that let you identify speakers of American English from the inland north. So if you hear someone go, oh man, 
um, you kind of know what's up. Yeah. Oh my God. Right. Let's move on to something far simpler, namely I monophthongization. And this is really just what it sounds like. You take the diphthong I and you just keep the first element of it, the vowel A. Yeah? On the vowel chart, that looks a little bit like this. So here I have visualized the diphthong I that you have, for example, in five. And uh, you reduce that, keeping only the uh, place where you start, <clears throat> so that five becomes five. Yeah? And uh, I'm going to say it again, five. Uh, and you may have guessed already, this is a feature of the American South. So here we are. Yeah, this is a map again of the atlas. And you see the areas where this feature is uh, present and especially pronounced in the areas that you see down here. Right. I monophthongization. Uh, so if you hear people having a good tam, then, um, well, you know what's up. Anyway, moving on to our fifth feature, this one you already know from the last video on British English. If you remember the guy saying goose yeah, or, or goose, uh, this will be a kind of deja vu. Deja vu. Um, so the, the, the goose vowel is realized further in the front of the mouth with a higher F2 than usual. And this feature is super widespread across North America. So there are this, only the little areas in blue resist the overall trend towards oo fronting. Yeah? Speakers in red, they all have a moderate degree of oo fronting. And the ones in purple, they are actually extreme. And you notice that there is not really a geographical pattern to this uh, oo fronting is more or less all over the place. Well, what can I say except ooh. Uh, right, we're coming to our sixth feature. There's bacon and there is Canadian bacon. There's raising and there is Canadian raising. And you will never guess where speakers have Canadian raising. The answer is uh, Canadian raising is found um, north of the US. And this finding was so striking that uh, people named the entire region after Canadian raising. So they called the place Canada. I know it's really incredible. But uh, what does this sound like? Actually, there are two flavors of Canadian raising. There is the about variant, which concerns the ow diphthong that is realized in such a way that the starting vowel, the place where you start, is just a bit higher than what is present in ow. Yeah? So ow starts down here and goes all the way up to uh, a back high vowel. And uh, in Canadian raising, the initial vowel is higher and a bit in the front. So this is about rather than about. I'm butchering this. No, if um, you have a Canadian friend, let them do that for you and uh, you will have a much nicer example of this. Anyway, that is the about, 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 about uh, variant. And uh, then there's also the five flavor of Canadian raising. So this concerns the I diphthong. And you can probably guess how that comes out in Canadian raising. Uh, so again, you uh, raise <clears throat> the initial vowel so that it's not five, but something like fave. Yeah. So you start up here with an e type sound and you go all the way up to an i type sound. You have a rather than i. Okay. Um, so those are the six features. Now, what we're interested in, of course, is which varieties have which features and how do they let us distinguish between them? Now, turning back to the North American Atlas of English, when you look at the varieties and you click on them, 
the atlas actually gives you an overview of the most important features. So for the south, we get, for example, uh, ooh fronting. We get eye monophthongization here. It's called glide deletion of eye. And we get a couple of other features that uh, are characteristic for southern U.S. English. We can do the same for the west, which has the low back merger, the cockot merger. It has uh, ooh fronting and it has a couple of other things that further distinguish the American West. We have the same for the inland north, which you see has actually a long list of features, including the uh, northern cities shift. It's the first one there. And um, surprisingly enough, Canadian raising is present in the inland north. I mean, these areas are adjacent. So yes, these things spread from one area to the other. And then there are a couple of other features that characterize the inland north. Uh, here we have Canada and uh, it's such a surprise. Canadian raising is a feature of Canadian English. I don't know about you. I found that really surprising. Right. So here I made a little grid with features that characterize four different uh, North American varieties, the West, Southern U.S. English, Northern U.S. English and Canada English. And um, <clears throat> um, you see that, well, there are features that uh, overlap, so to speak. So the caught caught merger is found in the West, in Canada, but not in the South. OK, so if you found a speaker who doesn't have that, well, you might be looking at a speaker who's from the South. The northern cities shift. Well, that is uh, found in the north, of course. I monophthongization again is a feature that we find in the south, but not so much elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> U fronting, I'm afraid, is pretty useless as a feature because we find it in all four variants. Uh, Canadian raising only in the north and in Canada. And finally, there's the pin pen merger. Also, that is a southern feature. Right. OK, so with this, we can actually do a couple of interesting things. Namely, we can try to identify and pinpoint where a mystery speaker is coming from. I've brought three recordings. I would like to play you all three of them. And I would encourage you to um, take notes, identify words that you think are uh, corresponding to the features that I've talked about. And uh, well, um, make a guess. Let me know in the comments where you think the mystery speakers are coming from. So listen to all three of them and check for each mystery speaker whether or not they show features like the pin pen merger, the cot cot merger, the northern cities shift, I monophthongization, ooh fronting, or Canadian raising and then match the speaker with one of the large dialect areas of North America, the West, South, North or Canada. And you notice we have four areas, but only three speakers. So one area won't have a speaker to go with it. Right. Uh, words to look out for. For the pin pen merger, you would need to look at words such as when or then or friend. Yeah, uh, the pin pen merger uh, shows up in pre-nasal environments. So when uh, eh is followed by a nasal, yeah. So then eh becomes i. The caught caught merger is found in words such as bought, thought, caught. Yeah. So when those words are lowered and uh, they come out as bought, thought, or caught, that's when you're looking at a specimen of the caught caught merger. The northern city shift, well, if you hear words such as yes or gad or bot, meaning but, yeah, um, it's really hard to do. But nonetheless, I encourage you to try and find an example of the northern city shift in the mystery speakers. I monophthongization, that's easier. So if people are having a good time, if uh, they're walking by or they tell you right, Right on, 
Yeah, um, that's I monophthongization. U fronting, so to do, to, zu, shu, uh, that would be that. And Canadian raising, well, instead of how, it's how, uh, about, shout, load, and uh, rate, tame, bay. I'm butchering this. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But, uh, well, you will get a chance to hear authentic examples of this in just a second. If you're ready, I suggest that we start with mystery speaker number one. I'm going to press play on this. And uh, just as a memory support, I've given you the grid with the features and the varieties. And uh, you can tell for yourself whether the mystery speaker has any of these features and uh, you can make a little cross on your computer screen or I don't know how you're going to do it. Take a piece of paper and uh, get this done in some way. Yeah, but I'm going to press play right now. Here we go. The cities that are safer are those that have neighborhood policing where the people that live in neighborhoods look at the police as their friends. They see them every day. The police know the kids that are in trouble or about to be. They work together to keep harmony and peace. We need to help those policemen by giving those kids something else to do. More one-on-one -on -one relations with successful adults. And when they do get in trouble, instead of sending them off to jail the first time, they ought to be kept in community boot camps where they can do community service work. Okay. I'm going to play this again, just for good measure. The cities that are safer are those that have neighborhood policing, where the people that live in neighborhoods look at the police as their friends. They see them every day. The police know the kids that are in trouble or about to be. They work together to keep harmony and peace. We need to help those policemen by giving those kids something else to do. More one-on-one -on -one relations with successful adults. And when they do get in trouble, instead of sending them off to jail the first time, they ought to be kept in community boot camps where they can do community service work. Okay. Um, that was mystery speaker number one. Here we have mystery speaker number two. Again, listen and see if you can find any of the features in the speech of the speaker. Here we go. Maybe I have some punk characteristics about me. That, did I say that properly? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I have some punk characteristics about me, but I don't walk around calling myself punk. It's more punk to tell people you're not punk than to sit there and say that you are punk. And whatever. I, if you, if you want to know what I think that I am, I think that I'm just a rock chick. And I like to rock out. I like to throw shit around. I like to go nuts. We need to listen to this again. Maybe I have some punk characteristics about me. Is that, did I say that properly? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I have some punk characteristics about me, but I don't walk around calling myself punk. It's more punk to tell people you're not punk than to sit there and say that you are punk and whatever. I, if you, if you want to know what I think that I am, I think that I'm just a rock chick. And I like to rock out. I like to throw shit around. I like to go nuts. Okay. Someone likes to go nuts. And we will go nuts with mystery speaker number three. Here we go. We sign and our, there's all this hype leading up to our next record. And it comes out and it sells about 25,000 copies in the first few weeks. And the label considers this a failure. And I was like, 25,000, isn't that a lot? They were like, no, nope, the sales are going down. It's a failure. And they walk off. Right at the same time, I'm signing and hugging after a gig. And a guy comes up to me and hands me a $10 bill. Gonna play this again? We sign and our, there's all this hype leading up to our next record. And it comes out and it sells about 25,000 copies in the first few weeks. And the label considers this a failure. And I was like, 25,000, isn't that a lot? They were like, no, nope, the sales are going down. It's a failure. And they walk off. Right at the same time, I'm signing and hugging after a gig. And a guy comes up to me and hands me a $10 bill. All right. So um, this is mystery speaker number one. Uh, you might recognize this gentleman. And the variety of this speaker is uh, Southern. 
U.S. English. And um, there are words such as uh, this one here. We need to help those policemen by. So uh, we need to help these policemen by. There is a uh, I monophonization in that. Let me play that once more. We need to help those policemen by. And uh, giving those kids something else to do. Giving those kids something else to do. Getting those kids something else to do. Yeah, that's that's you fronting. Uh, so these are only uh, two of the features. Uh, probably you found others in uh, that short recording. Here we have mystery speaker number two, the world's only Nickelback fan. And uh, let's listen to this because this is uh, quite telling. Characteristics about me. Characteristics about me. This is Canadian raising. Okay. Characteristics about me. About me. And let's listen to this. I like to rock out. I like to rock out. Um, I like to rock out. Yeah. So in uh, rock, you definitely hear the cod cod merger. Yeah. So it's not rock, it's rock. And it's rock out. <laughs> I like to rock out. Yeah, so if you like to rock out, then you're probably from Canada. And here we have mystery speaker number three. Let's listen to Amanda Palmer. Right at the same time. Right at the same time. Right at the same time. So a speaker from the inland north uh, also using Canadian raising. To our next record. To our next record. To our next record. To our next record. Okay. Um, she says for our next record. So the e eh sound in record comes out in a more centered way. So record. Um, anyway. Maybe you found other features. If you did, let me know in the comments. Other than that, I hope you had fun uh, listening to the different mystery speakers and you have uh, some idea about how to distinguish different varieties of American English. Uh, I hope to see you in one of the next episodes of this series. Until then, have a good time and I'll see you soon. Bye.